Hello, everyone. My name is Molly Halsey, and I'm the event specialist here at Enterprise DB. I will be your host today for our webinar, Democratization of Databases. I'm joined by Bruce Lomjin, core team member of EDB and co-founder co of the PostgreSQL Global Development Group. Before we get started, I just want to go through a few housekeeping items. This presentation is being recorded. We will be sharing the recording along with the slides after the broadcast. And the lines are currently muted, but if you have a question, please feel free to submit it in the questions panel. Today's session is scheduled for one hour. We expect the presentation to last most of our time today, and we will allot any extra time for a Q&A. If we do not have time to address all questions, we will follow up afterwards with any attendee whose question was not answered. Now, without further ado, here is Bruce. Hello, everyone. Great to be with you this morning uh, from Philadelphia. I'm um, very happy to be part of your day. And I'm being very happy to be part of your day presenting what I consider to be a really kind of interesting topic. Um, and and it's kind of a kind of a head scratcher, but uh, hopefully you're going to find it useful. Uh, one of the questions that I'm often asked as a as an open source person and somebody's really been involved with open source for probably uh, I guess 25 years now uh, is what makes open source work and why is it something I should care about and why is the quality of open source software so high? Um, and, and why does open source seem to have this sort of momentum uh, within, you know, within the development community? Um, you know, it, it's just, it's a different landscape than, than when I started. You know, I started in computers, um, gee, I guess back in, uh, um, oops, sorry, uh, back in 89, I guess, or actually even before that, but, um, you know, the, the era that we had where the sort of mainframes ruled the world and uh, closed source software ruled the world, that's that's kind of changed. And, and, and it's, it's changed subtly over time. Uh, there was a big shift sort of to Linux in, in the early 2000s. Um, but then the middleware kind of took over and, and now databases, I think, is, is really sort of the up and coming area. Uh, for open source in terms of enterprise adoption and 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 what I wrote this presentation for is really to sort of address what is the fundamental dynamic behind open source uh, what's the fundamental dynamic that that indicates that open source is going to be here for a long long time uh, those of you who might have seen my well Postgres live forever webinar or talk uh, I have an idea what I'm what I'm getting at uh, but the concept is that the you know the proprietary year is not coming back, and and a lot of almost everything we're going to be doing going forward is really related or around open source. And what I'm hoping to do in this talk is to sort of get to exactly what is it about open source that that makes it just so compelling? Uh, what is it about um, sort of architecturally uh, that that makes open source this thing that that really is is um, is different? Um, and why. Uh, so I, I kind of spilled that out and, and came to the idea of, of democratization of databases, the concept that, um, that, that databases are this thing um, that is, is kind of moving forward in the same way that other open source is moving forward, but fundamentally <clears throat> the, the, the internal process behind that the internal process of, of why it's moving forward relates to democracy. And I know obviously democracy has been in the news. Um, I'm flying to Hong Kong in, in September. So the, the sort of uh, demonstrations in Hong Kong have sort of been in my purview in the past week, make sure I'm going to get there. Uh, obviously there's been uh, democracy demonstrations in Russia as well uh, in the past week uh, and, and some other places. So, you know, democracy sort of striving, to break free, striving to sort of um, be heard within a, a larger uh, society is still something that is 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 being played out. It's being played out, obviously, um, in other countries. Um, some would say it's being played out in the United States um, <clears throat> or in other democracies in Europe. And uh, it's being played out in software. 
which you're like, really? You know, like it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. But um, once I'm, I'm done, I think you'll see it. What, what I'm going to show you today is a little bit about the history of governance, actually. Uh, we don't actually talk start talking about software until probably side 30 or 25. Um, we're going to talk about the history of governance, talk about the history of where governance structures work, where they don't work, what's the trends of governance over time. And then we're going to get into software. And we're going to try and explain how the patterns of governance that have changed over time are now uh, sort of affecting uh, software and how open source is in that mantle of democracy, in that the mantle of unlocking the potential of the citizenry in a lot of ways. And I think you're going to see a pattern. I, 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 I I understand it as I under having written this talk, I understand I think open source is better. Uh, but it really tempts to to unlock that question, why does open source work? What makes it so dynamic and what makes it so successful? Um and why is it going to be here for a long, long time? Okay. So um I I just sit back, I think you're gonna find interesting. I certainly found it interesting. Um writing it and having given it once or twice, I've I've gotten some really good feedback on it. So, um, first off, the history of governance structures. I didn't know that there actually is a place where democracy started. I, I you know, I knew it started in ancient Greece, um, but I didn't know exactly how or where. Well, it turns out that the Pinks, and I'm, I'm obviously pronouncing it wrong, but the Pinks Hill in Athens is the first place that democracy started. Now. In early Athens, there wasn't a there wasn't a country called Greece. Obviously, there were city states. There was Athens, there was Sparta. There's different kinds. And Athens, obviously, was was one of the bigger ones. And the concept that the citizenry or some segment of the citizenry, let's not say the whole citizenry, certainly, but some segment of the citizenry uh, was responsible for governance actually was was started in this location. If you go to Greece, uh, if you can actually go there. Uh, I was I was kind of interested in learning that I did not know that there was sort of a start location for this, um, and and having gone from that period to now, obviously there's been a tremendous movement toward democracy, but there's also been ups and downs, and um, uh, it's not a it's not a, a a continual improvement. There's a lot of um, setbacks as we go forward, and and we'll kind of talk about that to sort of explain also why open source um, and open source databases are not have a setback in a lot of ways. So I'm going to talk about two government structures in this talk. Uh, the first one is probably the easiest to understand. Uh, it's basically autocracy. Um, it's a concept that a single person or a small group of people have power. And everyone else just kind of has to follow along. Often this uh, autocracy is, follow, is, is, is reinforced by physical force. Um, in terms of military, in terms of police, in terms of uh, militia, in terms of laws uh, that imprison uh, prison people, um, and this is kind of a this is kind of the way that thing works. Uh, where are some examples of that? Dictatorship would be Syria, um, absolute monarchy, Saudi Arabia, communist uh, dictatorship or autocracy would be uh, North Korea. Um, so again, this is the case where a single person or a small group, maybe the Politburo in a communist situation, would would have power. Uh, there often is a figurehead up there, or actually the figurehead may be the person in power. And uh, the this is sort of the first governing structure. So if you think way way back, in terms of the chief of a tribe or or you know the head of a of a village, uh, this is kind of the way that would work. And and Often uh, changes in in autocracy are, are violent. Um, there isn't normally a structure for uh, different uh, people to to go into power, uh, except typically through some kind of violent overthrow or something. So these are very these are very volatile um, sort of structures. Re the second one is representative democracy. Again, first established in Athens. Um, historically, again, only a small group of people could vote. Usually, they were the landowners. Um, this is also true in, uh, in Rome and the way they handled it. Um, but you do elect representatives to vote on issues. So this is not 
this is sort of the first steps toward um, toward a more uh, democratic, uh, and, and obviously this has evolved over time. So um, having talked about that, we're going to talk about the strengths of each structure. And you may think, oh, well, democracy is always better or, you know, whatever. But that's not, I, I, it's not technically always true. Uh, one interesting thing about this picture is uh, it's, it's basically in Wales, um, which is below um, England in, in terms of the peninsula. Uh, the, uh, notice the curved structure here, that it's sort of a, tur a turret. And it's kind of falling down. You're going to see a turret later on, and it kind of alludes to this picture. So uh, autocracy strengths. Um, the, it is very good for focusing a fixed amount of resources on a clear goal. All right. So I, I don't want to walk in saying autocracy is always bad. Uh, for example, if you look at space exploration or the military, um, these are typically cases where you have a fixed amount of resources and you have a clear goal. And um, in those cases, autocracy is actually a very powerful structure. Uh, one of the one of the kind of funny aspects of uh, of military, you know, is is that even though the military is defending the uh, dem democratic structures, at least in the United States. Um, it is not a democratic structure itself. So, um, you know, a mil the military structure is actually one of the least uh, democratic structures uh, that we have. Uh, but again, it's structured that way because in a war situation, you don't have the option of sort of doing democratic voting or elected representatives or whatever. Um, you have something that you need to do it. And um, then another example, I think, that, that kind of ties into this is when the United States and the Soviet Union were competing in the 60s, 70s, uh, in terms of who was going to be able to control, you know, spheres of of the of the world. Uh, the two areas that the United States and the Soviet Union pretty much competed on were space exploration and war uh, and military. Uh, those areas uh, still were areas that, you know, when the United States did a space program, yes, we democratically elected the representatives to, to implement it. But it was a very top-down structure, right? And the same thing in the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union um, could very efficiently execute space exploration and, and military operations because it matched their structure. In our, in the United States case, it didn't match our structure, but we still basically created an autocratic structure to implement those goals. Um, so again, autocracy does have strengths. It's very clear to figure out what's going on, very clear to figure out who's responsible for what. Um, not great necessarily at harnessing huge um, outside help, but again, in those situations, you don't need it. <clears throat> democracy strengths are different. Uh, democracy strengths allow rapid adjustment for unclear goals. Uh, and, and this is very subtle, but if you think of the way that de democratic governments address problems, they effectively kind of through the through the feedback they get from the population who has elected them uh effectively are always sort of adjusting their positions on things if you think of how a politician adjusts their position on you know almost any issue it seems uh you know sometimes they go in for one thing and then later on they decide they're going to do something else because the population wants something else uh, then that's an example of democracy adjusting to those goals. And it's not perfect. Uh, there's certainly limitations of how it's done. Uh, there's certainly cases where it's not done very well at all. But it certainly does a better job of adjusting to, to the changes of goals than autocratic governments, which effectively don't adjust at all because they're only really interested in uh, what furthers the goals of, of that autocratic system. Another issue, and I think um, this is often overlooked, uh, is the idea that uh, democracy emboldens talent to act near the problem. So when you think of a communist system or, or an autocratic system, typically, um, and I've visited a lot of these countries, uh, pretty much everyone who's doing anything in the country is always looking up. They're always looking up to uh, what is the, how does, how do the police feel about what I'm doing? How does the, 
the security services feel about what I'm doing? How does the mayor and the feel about what? How does the government feel? What is the president or not the president, but the leader going to think of what I'm doing? So you have a tendency to look up a lot of times in autocratic systems and uh, effectively uh, a change of mindset from that autocratic system could, could eliminate exactly everything you're doing like within a day, right? In democratic systems, there is a, certainly a focus to push down decision making, to push down uh, rights as far down as we'll go. And that does embolden people to act at the problem. So classic case of a command control economy, um, something somebody needs, you know, a dishwasher is being made. Uh, it has a part that isn't working well or a part that's defective. Um, <clears throat> it's very hard for a command and control sort of economy to fix that type of problem where in a normal democracy, something's wrong with the thing, we fix it right away. And, you know, because we know we won't sell any if we don't. <laughs> and you, you, you are enabled to make that change. Uh, another aspect is democracy has a tendency to bring in more talent. So it has a tendency to, to make people feel uh, uh, engaged and therefore they can sort of get involved in stuff. So examples of where democracy works really well are consumer goods and software. Those are two cases where you have unclear goals, uh, it needs to be adjusted rapidly uh, to consumer demand. Um, you, you, you sort of are always changing things. Um, so it, every little decision doesn't have to be made at the top. Those decisions are pushed down as far as possible. And um, that's a good example, I think, of the difference between autocratic systems and democratic systems. However, uh, democracy, I've just sort of gone over autocracy and democracy, and you might think, oh, well, democracy is wonderful and everything should be done that way. Well, eh, uh, not always. Uh, this picture of a, of a protest in Madison, Wisconsin, not the most efficient way to sort of do things. Um, you know, it, it sort of clogged up the state house, uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's messy. Uh, there's no question it's messy. Uh, so, um, Democracy unleashes a flurry of activity based on agency, based on the fact that we've given personal power to so many people, but it does end up creating very fluid solutions. And it's sometimes hard to figure out where the fluidity is going. Uh, we've, you know, the United States obviously is always fluidly trying to deal with a whole bunch of problems. Um, and, and I'm not going to go into a lot of them, but, you know, you will kick up the paper there is a problem. Uh, we've got to deal with it. And sometimes the problems get resolved really quickly. And sometimes the problems take a long time to, to figure out. Um, I'm, 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 I've been reading the past week about, uh, about Brexit and the backstop, which relates to Northern Ireland and how that uh, backstop issue has sort of clogged up how, how the UK is going to resolve the Brexit problem, and nobody knows. And that fluidity of not knowing where the where the system's going, that fluidity of not knowing where Brexit's going to go, whether we're going to get out last May. No, we didn't go out last May, or, or we're, we're going to get out. They're going to get out in October. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty there, and that uncertainty is costly for companies and costly for individuals who don't know what's November going to look like for me. Uh, so. Again, that fluidity can be a negative um, that, that democracy brings. It's hard to predict behavior in a democratic system. You don't know when something's going to happen, uh, if it's going to happen. Problems can get stuck. You can get a problem that we know is a problem. Everyone agrees it's a problem, uh, but we can't seem to unstick it. We can't seem to figure out where that's going to, ch where that's going to go. Right. And some of these problems have existed sometimes for decades and and the democratic governments because of the way and, and because there isn't an answer, everyone kind of gets stuck on that. Um, I'm thinking the national debt, um, you know, gun violence, uh, you know, uh, income equality, um, uh, immigration. I mean, these are all kind of problems that we know are out there. Uh, we know they can be better solved than what we're doing now. But the democratic system can't seem to unlock a solution. And that's frustrating. And you have to balance that frustration and that uncertainty against the agency, against 
the empowerment part. And you're kind of you're kind of fight. You're not. It's again. It's not a win-win all over the place. It's it's kind of a mix of the two. Uh, large projects, for example, can be very hard to implement in democratic systems because they typically have to span multiple elections. Uh, probably the classic case in my mind is there is a tunnel connecting New Jersey, a, tra a train tunnel connecting New Jersey to New York City to Manhattan. Train tunnel was built by the Pennsylvania Railroad, I believe, in 1912 or 1918. So it's over 100 years old. I still take that train tunnel when I go to New York on the train. And the local governments, the New York government, the, the, the New Jersey government, the federal government cannot figure out how to replace this tunnel, right? And I guess in 1912 or 1918 or whatever they built it, they were able to put, they were, the Pennsylvania Railroad was able to do this and get it done. But because of all the complexity of how to do construction in New York, all the laws, all of the, the overages, all who's going to pay for it, which 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 um, which municipality or which government's going to level is going to pay for it, it sits there. It still works. Everyone's happy. They go back and forth on the, on the tunnel every day. But it's 100 and, over 100 years old, and it was damaged during the during the Hurricane Sandy and there's water in there. So they know they got to replace it, but they don't know how. And, and it's just, it, it's just a hard problem. Um, there have been some cases where people have tried direct democracy, which you don't hear about too much. Uh, the most clear example I can think of are California has a, a set of propositions, Proposition 13, Proposition 11, whatever, where they directly, where the populace directly the most, um, directly votes on issues. You do see in Pennsylvania a little bit where we have referendums on specific things, whether we should take a bond uh, to do a sp specific project. Um, there have been some uh, cases in Europe where they've tried to make democracy. And now that you have cell phones and you can sort of vote easier online, uh, there have been some sort of ramblings about that. The problem is a lot of these uh, issues are very hard to figure out. And it's very hard for somebody to vote for something that's really complicated. The Brexit's a classic example. If you look at the text of the Brexit, it says, you know, should, you know, should the United Kingdom leave the EU? But the whole complexity of how that, impl how's that implemented, how the customs service works, how does the backstop work for Northern Ireland? Is there a border between Northern Ireland and the rest of Ireland? Um, these are hard to say, and you can't put them in a referendum all the time. So again, the, a lot of times doing having representatives who spend time researching these things are really useful. Okay, however, having sort of bashed on democracy a little bit, there is ultimate success, success in democracy. This picture, uh, although I made it a couple uh, months ago, is actually of a protest in Moscow, which I've mentioned uh, in the news is, is sort of a new topic that people are talking about. Uh, you can tell it's Moscow because the little M in the back uh, of the subway. And I believe I even know this street. Uh, so anyway, uh, the concept of uh, that democracy is imperfect and uh, has problems doesn't mean that there aren't really valuable um, and, and, and sort of long sustaining benefits to democratic systems. Uh, but again, it has a checkered past. Again, I talked about it. First democracy in Athens. Um, started in Athens, but was suspended uh, during the wars. So uh, even though they started, Athens started with democracy, uh, they suspended it during wartime. Uh, and there are some instances in the United States, uh, unfortunately, where certain laws and, and even the rights of citizens have been curtailed during wartime. I'm thinking of uh, internment of Japanese uh, during World War II would be the clearest example. Although uh, there are examples also of free press being uh, curtailed during uh, wartime as well. Uh, Romans obviously also inherited democracy uh, from the Greeks and, and saw it as a valid system, uh, but <clears throat> uh, Roman democracy ended in dictatorship with the Caesars. So again, not a great pattern here. Um, they, they, they sort of started with it and then stopped. Middle Ages, um, very, very sort of checkered history with, uh, with democracy, not really tried too much. Magna Carta, sort of the, the big sort of the democratic document out of, uh, out of England at that time, 
Uh, Renaissance sort of started to bring democracy again into the into the forefront. Uh, American Revolution, obviously, big uh, big push for democracy. Although, as we know, as we know clearly, uh, you know, black people, women were not allowed to vote um, in in at the time of the American Revolution, and only were allowed to vote later, uh, maybe a hundred years later, uh, as the United States sort of evolved. The concept of, of democracy is applying to all citizens. Um, so, again, even the American Revolution, which you think of as this big democratic uh, event, uh, clearly eliminated at least over half, probably, of the population, um, which is not a great thing, but uh, it was a good step. Um, French Revolution, um, obviously, also a huge democratic push, uh, but that leads to monarchy and Napoleon's. Uh, so, uh, you know, not not sort of this is kind of an embarrassing uh, slide, but it is sort of what it is for democracy. But democracy does continue to make steady progress, uh, although there are still setbacks. This slide uh, I found tremendously illustrative. Uh, it shows you the number of people who are living in different government structures over time. So it starts in 1816, uh, which you would think of as sort of the um, French Revolution kind of period, uh, moves forward. And you can see it looks like around 19, uh, I'm sorry, 1850, uh, you start to see a, a small glimmer of democratic structures. Again, the United States was so small at that point, it just doesn't really register on this chart. Oh, no, I, I take that back. I think there's a little bit of green back to 1860, but again, very, very small. Um, 1900, you start to see, um, you know, it, it getting bigger, 1950, and then really it kind of like takes off there uh, at that point, and that green area becomes really big. Uh, so really from in the modern era, uh, the era of industrialization, the era of, of internet technology, the era of, of communication, really. Uh, the era of communication really kind of flips this over. And, you know, if you tracked, uh, I bet if you tracked worldwide television, worldwide radio, um, telegraph, and then uh, the spread of the Internet, uh, those are these are big, big things that have sort of spread the concept of democracy, the concept that people can have agency, that people can have control over their lives into areas of the world that it was not before. And um, again, democracy has setbacks, but I think this clearly shows that um, it's doing really well. Although uh, that autocracy is the dark red. And it's a little scary to look at this and say, yeah, like democracy is big, but autocracy has not gotten any smaller. Like same number of people pretty much back to 1816, it looks like. Uh, and, and in fact, it's grown quite a bit, um, maybe 40 percent or so. Uh, from that 1816 period, still living in autocratic countries. Uh, this is another, I think, a little more bold image, and I'm not as happy with this one because it really talks about landmass. It doesn't talk about uh, it doesn't talk about population centers. Uh, but effectively, what you have here is uh, at the bottom, uh, 1977, the democratic countries are in blue. And then, um, and the autocratic countries are in brown. Then, what you see pretty clearly in 2017 um, is that the autocratic countries have shrunk, and democracy has gotten much, much bigger, particularly Latin America. Um, huge change there. Uh, obviously, huge change in Russia, although that one is not blue yet; it's sort of off white or whatever you want to call it. Um, but but again, uh, you can kind of see the the movement of democracy going forward here. So uh, how does this relate to software? And you know, I I kind of mentioned earlier that there was a turret, a round turret that was sort of falling apart. And now this is kind of a round turret there. Um, this is Redwood City, California, a big software maker, database software maker. Um, but but it's kind of funny that uh, that that turret concept has sort of moved to the uh, moved to Silicon Valley. Um, so, what does, how does this relate to, how does democracy and autocracy relate to software, right? That is, I think, the big, big question. 
So I am going to talk about proprietary software as effectively autocracy. Because um, in a proprietary software system, the software is effectively controlled from the top. The executives make the decisions. Yes, they get input from sales and marketing, and they get indirect feedback from customers. So the, they're not completely in control of their own destiny. But the decision making is happening at the executive level. And a lot of the, uh, I want to say, uh, inefficient behavior or, or sort of um, odd behavior of companies in how they make decisions about software really follows from this problem. If you saw my Will Software, Will Postgres Live Forever talk, I, I go into this in a lot more detail. Uh, but but the, the concept of how decisions are made, how software decisions are made in proprietary software companies um, really relates to that autocracy concept. The concept that the decisions are being made in the best interest of the company or in the best interest of the executives or in the best interest of the shareholders is really sort of the fundamental concept. And the, and, and the concept that information is coming in from marketing and sales and customers is really only important in the sense that it shapes the decisions of the executives. So the decision matrix for proprietary call for companies is effectively summarized by the two bullets in this second section. Every decision they make is around this. If we do this, what percentage of customers will we gain? And if we don't, what percentage of the customers will we lose? This is the fundamental concept of how proprietary software, com software companies make decisions. They're not necessarily interested in how much the customer will benefit, they're really only interested in how much the customer will benefit in the sense that it relates to whether they'll gain or lose customers. It's, it's not the same concept. It's when, when, when a software company makes a tool that has not changed for eight years, like a client tool, I remember a lot of database companies doing this. The reason they do that is because improving the tool will not change whether they gain or lose customers. It might help the users. But if it doesn't affect the decision of whether they're going to stay or go, it doesn't get done. All right. Uh, gains are more sensitive to decision makers than losses, usually, because the, the it's, it's harder to, to leave. Um, uh, so always there's also, there's also a cost component. Is it cost is the gains or avoided losses justify the cost to do it? And that's how they're making decisions. So in open source, it really, you don't have that calculus. You have a mix of democracy and to some extent meritocracy. Um, voting can be problematic, um, but, you, but, but the, the way that decisions are made are not really related to how it will benefit the decision makers. They're, they're often really related to how they're gonna benefit the user community. Um, uh, sometimes you get very a lot of feedback um, in open source, uh, sometimes too much. There's a concept called bike shedding where people decide what color to paint the bike shed. Um, but again, it's, it's, you get a lot of information. Um, if you make a bad decision, it can be quickly corrected. It's easy to revert stuff. We do that all the time. Um, but one problem with open source is there's no reliable roadmap because there's nobody making decisions that can stick for years and years because we can always change our decisions. So again, democracy and open source has that problem that you can't always predict where it's gonna go. You know it's gonna be in best interest of the users, but you can't predict exactly how. Um, the internet does make, make direct democracy impossible. You can share ideas very quickly and rapid communication makes that democratic process work very quickly in open source, much quicker, frankly, than it works in uh, in democracies that run governments. <clears throat> if you make a mistake, you hear about it a lot quicker <laughs> in open source 
and we correct it a lot quicker, I think, than than governments can. Uh, partially because we're dealing with uh, software which can be easily changed, but also because the funnel of information that we get from uh, our user base is really, really phenomenal. Um, and that is one of the reasons I think that open source is so popular and, and actually so um, good at providing, at creating great software because that, that democratic feedback is so rapid. Let me put some pictures on this concept. So this is a picture of autocratic software development. And <clears throat> what you can see is on the left, all of the activity happens independent of the users. And then only once the software is released do the users get to see it. And then through sales, there is a feedback loop that comes back and gives information to the company that's developing the, the software in an autocratic fashion. Um, contrast that with open source where all of the phases of development are happening with the user input. So whether it's feature development, patch review, testing, beta testing, whatever, our users are intimately involved in everything we're doing because everything we're doing is public. So they're able to see everything we're doing and because we're on public email list, they're able to give us their feedback on what we're doing. Um, in, in a really, I think, powerful way. There is another software model that I wanted to talk about real fast, and it's what we call the hybrid model. And I just want you to be aware of it because I don't want you to go through this talking thing, oh, there's authoritarian, proprietary, and then there's democratic open source. No, there is a thing in the middle which we're going to call private to pri hybrid development. And I want you to be concerned about this because unless you understand how it works, you can get fooled to think it's democratic and it's open source and it's open source development. Um, hybrid development has a single company controlling development. Uh, it has an open source distribution, but the decisions are made in an autocratic manner. All right, so um, just be aware that when you're using a hybrid piece of software, you're not getting the kind of democratic development process that you typically have. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of democratic feedback. Um, it is more comfortable for users tra tra transitioning from proprietary because there's a single company that controls everything that's going on, where you get support, where you get training, where you can see the roadmap. Um, MySQL, MariaDB, MongoDB are really all cases where the distribution is open source, but the, uh, the decision making is in a lot of ways autocratic and just be aware that this is an issue i have a, a URL, some url there to kind of see if you're curious of exactly how this is working okay so where does this leave postgres i kind of love this picture just like kind of a cool shot so postgres wins because democracy eventually wins um postgres uses democracy to attract talent our talent cool pool of people can easily compete with proprietary staff. This is the sort of fundamental, how does an open source project with no money compete against billion dollar companies? We do, and we do it very well. We do it because we can attract a talent pool far larger than even a proprietary company, a billion dollar company can hire. Uh, we have superior feedback and decision matrix, which leads to success. Um, it, it's a ch this is a challenge. If you have a niche piece of software, this is hard because it's hard to generate enough open source developers who care about something. But in, in Postgres case, because we're infrastructure software, it's very easy um, to attract people who care about our software and will help us make it better. But setbacks are still possible. Okay. Um, when I started with Postgres, we were sort of down in the bottom of the red dot, red line. But because we had a steeper improvement curve, effectively we matched, and then I would say it's to some extent surpassed closed source software and proprietary software in feature performance and reliability, and we'll just continue to make that better. This is a similar curve you'd see for Linux or any of the other projects. So democracy in action, what does this look like for Postgres? I love this picture too. Um, Postgres is extendable, and this has actually been sort of a driver behind 
uh, a lot of the advances that Postgres has had uh, in terms of handling new workloads. Um, Postgres has done a very good job of focusing on multiple things at the same time. Usually a proprietary piece of software can only focus in one or two directions at a time. Like, oh, this is going to be our cloud release, or this is going to be our ease of use, our, you know, you release, or this is going to be a performance release. Postgres is, is always improving, like, in different directions at the same time. So we're, if you look at any release of Postgres, and we put out a major release every year, you see ease of use improvements, you see performance improvements, you see enterprise improvements, you see scaling improvements, you see new workloads for things for app developers and things for the cloud. I mean, we're just improving all bunch of places all the time, which I think is tremendously powerful for Postgres. Um, foreign data wrappers, here's another area where Postgres excels. Uh, we don't, we aren't scared of you interacting with other products. Usually proprietary people are scared of you interacting with other products because you could leave them. But Postgres, we don't care. So we interact with a whole bunch of different projects and different data sources. We have foreign data wrappers for over 100 different data sources. Um, another area where I think Postgres um, really, really shines. Over 100 interfaces, read, write, you can do sophisticated things like join pushdown and sort pushdown. If you don't leave, believe me, look at the URL there in pink. There it is a talk I, where I talk about uh, foreign data wrappers and extendability in general. Talking about how Postgres being designed to be extendable has allowed it to morph into a whole bunch of different workloads very transparently. We have an extension network. It's called PGXN, which effectively um, brings together a whole bunch of external projects that can be plugged into Postgres. If you're curious about that, take a look. PostGIS is one of the most popular extensions for Postgres. It allows for GIS capability to be added to the relational database Postgres. It's developed by a separate team. Uh, they have their own release schedule. They have their own, um, they don't really ask us for a whole lot. They, they use the Postgres extension API and have been doing this for probably 12 or 15 years, uh, effectively creating an extension that adds on top of Postgres, which adds the GIS. This is a great example for me. The extension capability is a great example of democratization because we're allowing people around our orbit to effectively work within our ecosystem and to independently develop software that works transparently with our software. See what I'm saying? We're, I think by, by building the database platform in an extendable way, we can attract people and give them agency, give them power to create additional pieces of software which work with our software. Same thing with foreign data wrappers. Another example of us sort of building that ecosystem around the database. Uh, who are our people? This is a 2006 picture of our first conference. The amazing part is not the people here and the number of people here in 2006. The amazing part is how many people are still here. So I haven't counted, but I believe 80 to 90% of the people in 2006 in this picture are still with our project. Uh, and what that tells us is that once people get involved, they stay involved because they realize that this is a place where their effort and their ideas are valued and are acted on. And I think that is a tremendous example, as I talked about before, of how democracy gives people voice and it gives them a place to have impact. And I think that is a fundamental reason that Postgres has gotten so big and will continue that way. Uh, if you're curious, the scope of where we geographically cover, uh, this is just my scope. This is the scope of all the places I have been. Uh, that's not obviously all of the events because we've had events in a lot of other places, uh, but this is where I have been over the past 20 years. Uh, in terms of advocating and evangelizing for Postgres. How does open source do voting? Uh, we've sort of developed structures over time. Uh, we have a committer team of 20 or so committers. There is a web page that should add the URL, but there's a list of committers uh, that Postgres um, has nominated. So committers nominate new committers 
So that's the way that works. Uh, core team nominates new core team. Uh, we've talked about having elections for core team, but we're not quite sure, sure how to do that. That's still an ongoing discussion. Uh, but but the development is open to all, uh, even an occasional visitor. Somebody shows up, you know, literally it's like let the best idea win. Everyone can, you know, can kind of come and give their opinion. I, I often am reading the email and I'll be like, I'm reading an email of somebody I've never heard of before and he's giving a great idea. And I'm like, where did this guy come from? Like, what? Well, again, I, I'm guessing, I'm looking at the name. I'm trying to guess where they're from, from their email domain. Maybe the signature tells me where they are. Uh, but they just showed up with a great idea where I've never heard of them before. So again, that a power to bring in people, I think, is tremendously powerful. And tre that's really the crux of, of our success. Um, in, in my mind, we focus talent like a lens on every task. And if you've ever been involved in Postgres development or watch development happen, uh, it really feels like that. It feels like we're able to focus talent in a way that others have re really cannot. Uh, it is a little hard to have a roadmap in Postgres. Uh, individuals and political parties have roadmaps, but democrat democratic governments don't, partially because they don't know they're going to be in office a, a couple of years from now. So it's kind of hard. You can do short-term stuff, but long-term stuff is hard. Um, closed source companies, developers uh, have their own roadmaps. I have a roadmap of what I'd like to do. But Postgres as a project doesn't because we can't because we don't know what people are going to want to do. Uh, we can't control who, what people work on. So it's very hard to like make them do something. Uh, but again, we do have a to-do list and you can kind of get an idea of what's going on. So again, you don't have a roadmap, but at the same time, you can affect the roadmap. You can advocate for certain features. You can even, if you really want to, write features and, and submit them to us and then be part of that process. So again, it's a mix. It's not all great to be democratic. We have some limitations, but as I think I've showed here, the, the the advantages I think in software far outweigh the disadvantages. If you're curious about actually what goes on in Postgres, I have a web, there's a website called PG Life. You are lower at the bottom, and it basically in one screen captures the IRC channel, the Twitter last Twitter feed, the last article, the last blog entry, the last email, the last commit to the source tree the last, uh, all the releases and what commits have been made recently. So this is sort of a one-stop shop to see everything that's going on uh, in Postgres. And you can see democracy in action, I think, by watching that screen. At least that's how I view it. So what did I do today? I kind of took you from autocracy, being single control to democracy in government terms, we talked about some of the some of the up and ups and downs with different democratic systems, and then finally I showed you how that applies to open source, and particularly Postgres in general. And I tried to close it out by giving you sort of a feeling of exactly what's going on. Uh, in terms of going forward, uh, we do have a Postgres 12 release which we're actively working on. Uh, we expect that release to be out in maybe a month or two. Uh, if you want a copy of this presentation or you want to look at any of my other presentations, the URL there at the bottom on the left is my website, and you can feel free to look there. There's probably 20 or 30 presentations there. Many of them have videos. So if you want to watch a presentation and maybe watch a video of it, uh, feel free to do that. There are also 550 blog entries on that website, and they're also categorized uh, so you can get blog entries about administration, about performance, about open source, about data modeling, um, about pretty much any topic that I write about. Uh, also going forward, we have some events uh, coming up. We have, a, uh, we have a conference in Orlando uh, coming up in September. We have also one in San Jose in September. And I will be attending the conference in Bali. So there is a conference in Bali in September, and I'm going with my wife. So uh, September, we have Orlando, Florida, San Jose, and Bali. In October, we have a big conference in Milan, Italy, and I'll also be attending that with my wife. So again, uh, we have some cool events coming up. Uh, feel free to look at the Postgres website to get a full list of all the events that might be happening in your area, 
uh, there's pretty much a conference every month or two, one, two, one or two conferences every month uh, somewhere in the world about Postgres. Uh, so if you want to really meet the people and see what's going on, uh, that's often a really cool way of doing it as well. Uh, but again, we have a lot of activity going on, releases going on, PG Life, blogs going out. Uh, it is a very active community, and uh, hopefully it's going to stay that way for a long time. So uh, that does conclude. I think we might have some questions. And maybe Holly has some yeah. to add as well. So thank you so much, Bruce. Um, we do have a few questions. The first one is, has Postgres always used a democratic development model? Well, <clears throat> uh, Postgres started in 1986 at the University of California at Berkeley. So the first 10 years of Postgres from 86 to 96 uh, were really controlled by the University of California at Berkeley under Michael Stonebreaker. Now, in the latter years, uh, Jolie Chen and Michael and, and Andrew Yu sort of took, took charge of sort of releasing it and adding SQL to it and so forth. Uh, but that first 10 years, I would say, was sort of the academic period for Postgres. And um, I don't necessarily think it was super democratic. Uh, they released code, and I think they got patches or bug fixes from people. But the focus of the project in the first 10 years were really around uh, academics and sort of testing different academic ideas uh, in the database. Uh, since 1996, when I got started, it has been democratically run. Um, we, you know, we, we have people coming in all the time. When I started in 96, we probably had a hundred or 200 users. <laughs> That's obviously much more now. Um, but since then, yeah, I, if you look at some open source, there are some projects, particularly Linux, uh, which has a tendency to be a little less on the democratic side, uh, much more focused around a single, uh, person in Linux, Torvalds, uh, Postgres has always favored the democratic style. I think it's much more effective. I think it's much more, uh, it, it, it empowers people more, I think, to have the democratic structures. And uh, I would not want to change that. And I don't think, I don't think there's any desire that, that that would ever change for Postgres. Okay. And then I have one more question. And it's, is autocratic software development even better than democratic? Well, autocratic software is great if you have one target. So um, the one example I can think of that I read about recently, because we had the 50th anniversary of the Apollo lun lunar, lunar landing, um, there was a great article in the Wall Street Journal about the development of the software that ran the, lo the lunar lander. If you get a chance, just look it up, uh, Wall Street Journal article in July. Um, and it interviewed the person who actually wrote that software and the person, the team responsible for it out of MIT. And <clears throat> that's a case where you kind of have a very limited timeline. You have a very hard requirement. Um, and <clears throat> obviously back in, you know, 1968 or 67 when they were writing it, uh, you know, there wasn't an internet to really get a whole lot of ideas in there. Um, so that's probably an example where autocracy, I think, makes a lot of sense, where you have a clear goal, you have a fixed piece of hardware, uh, you got one thing to do, right? Um, and you're going to put as many people on it as you can. But, but historically, if you look at how uh, Microsoft has reacted, how Oracle's reacted, how, um, you know, Google, to, well, Google's kind of a funny case, but how proprietary software has re reacted to open source, what happens is that the open source is super dynamic and continues to evolve and continues to polish and improve. And when you look at the non, the proprietary stuff, it kind of stagnates. So I'm thinking of Informix or Sybase or DB2. and They just came to stagnate and the open source just kind of takes off. And the same way that Solaris was, was end of life by Oracle, because Solaris just couldn't keep up in terms of innovation. Uh, in the same way that open source has. So the crux of it is that proprietary software works great if you have one goal. But anytime you need to innovate, anytime you need to bring in new people, anytime you need to sort of uh, evolve, uh, proprietary software never can seem to do that and just kind of falls over. And my talk about will Postgres live forever really goes through that those five stages of proprietary software um, and, and, and how you go from innovation to 
to sort of market growth to um, to sort of uh, maintenance mode at the end where you're just kind of like hanging on there, trying to keep as many customers as you can and spending as little money as you can. Uh, those structures really work poorly for for end users of software. And I think I think ultimately end users of software, they're really the people who benefit. Great. Thank you so much, Bruce, for talking to us today about democratization of databases. That looks like all of the questions that we have today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for the webinar. We will be sharing this recording along with the slides with you as soon as possible, and I hope you all have a great day.